Do you love the survival shows but not the drama? Do you ever wonder if the skills they show are for real? Come with Justin Wolf and Larry Roberts as they show what it takes to really do what they show on TV. Watch them as they act out different scenarios and show you the common mistakes most people make when faced with the tough choices you can be faced with when all does not go as planned in the wild. Hey guys, welcome to another edition of Clothed and Confident. Today's episode, my video might be a little bit different than Justin's. We discussed this, we thought about taking someone who doesn't exactly do this kind of stuff on a regular basis and bringing them out into the woods and showing them how hard survival really is. The problem that I had with that is I didn't want my partner to be absolutely miserable. And I this appreciate is, that. <laughs> this is Joe. I've known Joe since he's about five years old. He's a great family friend. And he doesn't do this stuff all the time. He's a hunter, but he doesn't, you know, come out and tarp camp all the time. So Justin's going to use his wife. My wife said, heck no. <laughs> so we got Joe out here. And like I said, I couldn't figure out a way to make survival. So, I mean, there's no reason to make him miserable. There's no reason to bring him out here. And I mean, survival is miserable. It's hard. It's basically cuddling around a fire, trying not to die. What's fun about that? Let's turn it around. Let's show them a little bit of bushcraft and stuff. Let's, let's do a little tarp camping. Let's show them some fire skills. Let's uh, bring him out of his comfort zone a little bit and let him have some fun. All right, let's get started. Okay, Joe, I brought you out here with a few simple things, but uh, some things you saw, some things you didn't. Let's take a look at your haversack because I know you don't know what's in there. So go ahead and open it up and let me know what you think each thing is for. Some things will be obvious, some things won't be. Garbage bag, okay. right here essentially. Okay. I would assume that's for some sort of coverage, maybe to lay on if it's damp. Okay. Water bottle. Is there anything in it? Empty. Okay. I would think that's for water. So this, I would assume, is for boiling water over a fire. Okay. I would guess, anyways. Swedish Fire Steel Scout Emergency Whistle. I think it's fairly self-explanatory if you find yourself in an emergency. We can always whistle for Rachel back at the house, right? Exactly. <laughs> Come out and rescue us. <laughs> Just some twine. I guess I don't know what you'd call this guy but just some twine for roping up coverage or whatever you may need it for you know I think I've seen you use this stuff before I assume this is for starting a fire right here I don't know what all the materials are for exactly but I guess that's what I would guess that's for I think I think this is just the cover Maybe not. Oh, just like that. Okay. I, I want to say that this is part of your fire making process as well. I don't know if you hit it off steel to make an ember or whatever you may do, but that's what I'm guessing that's for as well. So, and I believe that is all the contents of my haversack. All right. Cool. You got most stuff basically dead on, so that's exactly what we're going for. Good. Okay, Joe. Well, it looks like you got everything pretty much figured out. You got, you know, you've got basically you got a tin, you got a fire, you know, ferro rod, you've got a cup, you got a stainless steel water bottle, you got your garbage bag. We call those are contractor bags. They're heavy duty. You got your haversack. I forgot what else I threw in there. Your your uh, whistle. And, yeah, your whistle, your flint and steel. What do you think the first? Well, first of all, are you thirsty or hungry? Use some water, probably. That's the first thing we're gonna do. We need to make, we need to go find some water, and make it safe to drink. I know I've got a, we've got a creek runs through my property, and up creek is where I trapped those two beaver that were having their way in the water. 
So we gotta make it safe to drink. Let's go do it. Okay, Joe, and this is our water supply. If you wanna fill up your container. Now take a look inside there. Are there any massive amounts of floaties and nasties and No, I don't see I don't see any. You don't? Yeah, I see little bits of stuff. Okay. Very little. I have a bandana if you'd rather filter it through the bandana. I kinda wanted you to see what would end up in the water. There's a couple of little tricks. I'm gonna show you real quick here. And then you can you can decide whether you wanna do it or if that water's good for you. Let okay. me fill up mine and I'll show you real quick. But if you get squeamish, sometimes you take a woman out, or, you know, not that all women are squeamish, some guys are too, but, um, or if you just don't want that stuff in there, then you can do it like this. One thing about this, though, is it takes a long time, and sometimes, see, I didn't even hardly get any water in there at all. Yeah. What you gotta do is you gotta kind of saturate it, and get the, because it's almost like it's naturally water repellent. So you squeeze it. And then it's not, actually then too, it's not as big a deal to point it upstream. Because it can be a pain to fill up like this. Well, one thing I'm wondering is, I know what you're trying to prevent from having it downstream, but at the same time, you got to imagine a little bit of stuff can sneak into the pieces. Yeah. Yep. Now it's starting to fill. You see the bubbles down by my, my thumb. It's starting to fill, and that's... That's basically where it's filling, is those creases, like you're saying. It's not really going through the cloth that well. Huh. It's, it's actually a quite a, a tight woven cloth. Is this what you typically do to fill up your bottles, or do you just put it right in there like I did? Depends on what it looks like. If it looks like what your water bottle looked like, I would just do it like that, because there's not, there's hardly really nothing in there. Your water bottle looks fine to me. To me. Okay. All right, Joe. When we get back, we're going to need a fire. So I see a resource right there that I want you to grab. Perfect. All right, dump that in your front pocket. We should have brought our haversacks, but we didn't. All right, Joe, you got your haversack all packed up. The first thing we're gonna do, the first fire you're gonna make today is a ferro rod fire. You're gonna make a couple of fires, but ferro rod's the first one. You grabbed some birch bark already. I wouldn't mind getting a little bit more birch bark. And then we need to, it rained here the other day, so all the ground is pretty wet. And if we were to make a fire on the wet ground, it wouldn't do that great. So we need some sticks or whatever to lay down first. And then we need some very, very fine combustible material. That birch bark's gonna work real good. Also dried, very dried grasses work. Very dried stringy bark works. We're gonna want a, um, about a softball and a half sized thing of grass and birch bark and really dried stuff like that and then we're going to want to go with pencil lead sized very dry sticks and move our way up the tinder level from there to kindling to fuel and stuff like that but anyway we need a base for our fire and we need to start gathering the materials for our fire so we can have some water okay Dre, uh joe sorry that popple tree right there it's dead Take a look at that bark and let me know what you think of that. Open, open some of that up. The very stringy, fibrous parts. Use your nail on the inside. There, stuff like that. Yep. Now see the stuff that's attached to the tree still? Yeah. That stuff's gold right there. Okay. Joe, normally when you go camping, how do you make a fire? With a lighter? Right, with a lighter, but then what do you use in addition to the lighter? What fuel do you use? Paper or birch bark? Well, or typically we use like 
either newspaper or we grab a bunch of, I mean, smaller branches. Not this small typically, but a lot of times either we'll make a teepee of smaller branches or I guess log cabin style of somewhat small branches and fill it with newspaper or put a newspaper under it. Okay. And then we typically just try to light the paper and hope it works. Okay. <laughs> This is basically the same principle, except for you're not using newspaper. Yeah. Essentially, the bark is your newspaper. Correct? Exactly. Yep. Okay, so Joe is processing birch bark down, like how I, when I do the, the plant method for the ferro rod, and I have birch bark with me, that's how I want to do it. He's going to make a little fire on that piece of birch bark, and it's windy, so we're going to have to make sure, just like that. See how them curls are staying on that, yep. that birch bark? Yep, yep. So we're going to want to catch that on fire, and then we're going to transfer that fire to our fire lay. It's not the prettiest fire lay, but we just did it down and dirty. We want to get a fire going so we can get our water processing. Okay, so go ahead and do that. Put, put your knife away first, though. Oh, yeah. and then do that plant method like we talked about. There you got it on fire. Try to feed that little sucker. Oh, almost. Let's try to push. It's close, huh? Yep. Put the ferro rod almost right, yep, right there. Sideways, kind of. Oh, we made it go out. We need to get some more curls. Okay. I mean, we need a little bit bigger thing of curls. Okay. It's kind of getting the hang of it at the end there, but. Yep. Yep. Do I want it on the edge or in the middle? Right in the middle, basically, because the spark is going to travel. This, yeah, the spark is going to go from there to just slightly in front of the ferro rod. The harder. I know, I just don't want to yeah. slip and knock it off. Okay, so if you're worried about that, then do the other plant, the other method, like I said, and you can still plant the ferro rod, but pull the ferro rod back hard. Oh, let me see. There you just got it. Now turn it sideways, nurse it, and get it into. Hold on a second. Oh, okay. yeah. That's all right. all right. Let's uh, let's help ourselves out and go ahead and get the. You want to do it up here or? No, that's okay. I was we'll gonna get, sit on this. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we'll get that on fire as soon as you get flame. Put that in there, and then I'll lift the tinder bundle up for you. As soon as I get flame, put that guy in there? Yep. All right. There, right there. Now put that on there. Oh, yeah. Now throw it in the tinder bundle. Right under there. <laughs> nice. Way to go. That'll take off. Sweet. First wow. ferro rod fire, huh? Yeah. Boy, that goes up fast. Yeah. And there's other methods. I mean, you know, we could have taken that whole tinder bundle, and I'm going to show you this with flint and steel. There's a lot of different methods you could do. That was just just one of them. That's not the most ideal method when it's windy like this, but sure. it's you know it's a method. All right, we gotta feed that fire. Okay. All right. Now we've got the water boiling. Do you have the fine? Oh yeah. Okay, so we got the water boiling. Get my hand out of the flames, and I'm gonna show you that trick on how to get the water bottle out of there.
that's just barely holding on. I want to get it out of there. I've never had it slip yet, even though that's just barely holding on there. It seems to, you're catching it in the neck of the bottle there. Yeah. And if you make, oh, it's stuck on there. If you make it off center, if you make your knot on your stick off center, it'll do sideways like this. Yeah. Instead of straight down like this. Yeah. It'll go sideways and then you can get it in and out you can easier. Drop it in there. Yep. That's it. Let her cool down and we'll have something to drink. Okay. One thing you can do, but one thing that we're always looking for is the next fire. Making the next fire that much easier. This time, you know, you did really good your first time using a ferro rod. Next time we're going to use a different method. And with that method, we're going to use char cloth. So you, you can see there's a little tiny bit of char cloth in there. Mm -hmm. That's what we want our product to look like. So go ahead and put that 100% cotton, leave the char cloth in there, and put that 100% cotton, yep, stuff inside the container. Just stuff it all in there. That's what we want the end product to look like was that black stuff that was in there. Okay. And then you can put the lid on and it doesn't have to be super, super, there, just like that, perfect. Throw it right in the middle of the fire. Perfect. There you go. All right, we're gonna make some char cloth for flint and steel fire for later on tonight. Should we be covering it up? To we just need to make sure that it stays. We need to make sure that inside of it, it is hot enough so that it basically burns without oxygen. And what you'll see is you'll see the smoke start coming along the edge here yeah. of the lid. So yeah, we just need, you know, we can pile some more stuff on there. Generally, I don't like flame because sometimes flame will the smoke along the edge is basically gas, very combustible gases. And once in a great while, if it catches on fire, I've seen it kind of travel in your container. This one, it won't do it just because some people put a hole in the top of their container. Mm -hmm. I don't ever feel that's necessary because gas is, air is, it, it, this is definitely not watertight, right? Mm -hmm. And water is thicker than air. So I know for sure it's not airtight. Okay. So no reason to put a, put a hole in it. But do you see the smoke starting to come around from the outside? I do. Yep. We want to keep these coals on there and everything until that smoke stops. And then maybe even for like five minutes or so even after it stops. So yeah, we'll just keep adding, you know, coals. You can just play with the fire, pick up, tong, you know, use tongs, put some coals around it, whatever you want to do. We'll just let that cook. Okay, Joe, if you come over here, I'll show you just a couple of real basic knots. What we're going to do is, you're going to make a foul point shelter with a tarp. So what we need to do is have a ridge line. You could do this type of shelter if you were up against a tree or something, but there's not really a tree right where I want it to be. So we're going to utilize this cordage instead, just this paracord. And do you know how to do a bowline? I do not. Okay. It's not really that complicated. We could do just a loop. We could do just a loop like this and then string it back through so it's like a lasso type deal. Mm -hmm. But we might as well do a bow line here real quick. So, and we're gonna want it, you've got a huge tarp. Normally you go about nipple high or whatever. We'll go a little bit higher. Basically you take this, you, you know, whatever. Turn the car and you turn your key, like mm -hmm. the car, car ignition. String it through. Up. Around, back down again, and it's important to dress the knot correctly. That means by tightening it correctly. Okay. You see how that loop goes around that right there? Yes. This is a good knot for like a lot of different stuff, like towing your car, whatever. Because no matter how tight it gets, you can still take it take it off. The knot comes apart very quick, easily. In other words. Okay. Around, back down. I'm gonna let you tie that knot real quick.
I just tighten it? No, it's done. We don't need it to suck up against the tree because we're going to put tension on it. Okay. So now, sure, sure. So now we'll go over here. All right, I showed Joe the trucker's hitch real quick, so he's learned the bowline and the trucker's hitch. And now he's gathering some toggles, and we're going to set his tarp up in a plow point. That usually, we're not going to rely on fire for heat. He should have a very comfortable, nice bedroll. So this plow point will be nice for him. There won't be any wind or anything like that getting in there. All right, Joe, I've already made up some of these little, you'll recognize this cordage. This is that bank line, some stuff you have. Mm -hmm. But I carry them already all made up, and you're going to use your toggles. And what we're going to do is spread out your tarp and give me a corner of them. You can set the toggles there if you want. Give me a corner, you said? Yep. Find just the corner of it. All right, we'll spread it out. This is a huge tarp. This is bigger than what you need, but that's what I have. Okay. Alright. Oh. Doesn't really matter. Alright, so we'll get this here. And let me show you this knot real quick. This is basically a prussic knot, they call it. But you keep you keep that knot off center. And you you go mm -hmm. around and then around again. And this one's important to dress up too. They call it dressing the knot when you're making it perfect. When you're making the knot correctly. You just use the knot end. Go around and then go around. So what's the purpose of it doesn't go nowhere? Oh, okay. Now, the purpose of that, but now you have a way to grab a toggle to attach your tarp to this ridge line, and it's easy to undo. So put your toggle between there, and they say that, there you go, just like that, they say that by using these toggles, it will prevent your grommets from ripping out of your tarp sure. as easy. Now what Compared you do, to just tying it. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Now what you do is you take, see how we, we've got a hammer, our baton. Yep. We've got them stakes mm -hmm. and you've got them strings. And you don't have to do the fancy little knot on the stakes. Mm -hmm. All you need to do is put the stake through the grommet and put exactly. it in the ground. Yep. That's it. All right. All right. So we're getting, we're getting cracking here. It's going to be a huge shelter, but like I said, we're not worrying about heat loss or anything like that. He'll have a nice bedroll. All right, we'll do the other side. Go ahead and stake the other side down, and we'll be good to go. Now, take a look at this right now. Look at how the shelter is set right now. Let's say you had a gale force flipping wind from this side over here. Mm -hmm. You could, not that this would help a ton, but now you've got a vapor barrier, mm -hmm. and you can stake it down. You know, you can stake it right here, mm -hmm. and look at how nice of a shelter that is right there. Essentially a tent. Yep, exactly. That's all it is. But let's get the full experience and do this side bring it out over here. The only bummer with all these ridge lines is now you got to watch out and you don't clothesline yourself. <laughs> okay, now that's actually quite low, especially with our bedding that we're going to put in there. So... I can do a few things. I can raise this ridge line, which wouldn't hurt at all, or I can somehow get this middle of this tarp to go up. All right, we're not going to do that other trick where we lift up the back of the tarp. I think that's just fine. So how's your water? Is it cooled off at all? Well, it's steaming still. The bottle seems pretty hot, hot to the touch at least. Now, a lot of people go camping and utilize uh, purifying their water in this method. Now, it's either that, or you pack, you know, a $50, $60 water filter where you can have water in about three seconds. Yeah, I've used those. Yeah, that's, I don't know, the water filter, I'll pack the extra weight. I mean, this is fun, but, you know, and this is survival type deal, bushcrafting type deal. You, at least you know now, you can purify water by boiling it. 
but it takes a long time to process it. Well, it's obviously essential if your back's against the wall, but with those filters, <laughs> man, you can fill up a lot. Of, you can get a lot of water really fast. Yep. Now, one thing we can do, and we'll grab them real quick, is we'll grab our cups, and we can get some of that hot water into a cup, and then it will cool wow. off a lot faster. Sure. All right, Joe, how does that water taste? I think it tastes pretty normal, to be honest. Like I said, there's a little bit of a metallic taste just because of the cup, I think, but in general, it tastes... Uh, just pretty standard water, hot water. <laughs> yeah, some people say it tastes flat. Do you notice that? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't really think it tastes markedly different than the water I drink on a daily basis, to be honest with you. Neither do I. I've never tasted a, a weird taste. No. I've always tasted a little bit of the metal taste, like you said. But a lot of people out there say, oh, it's flat. you got to shake it in your water bottle to get it better again. Or, or you know... And then also depends on which part of the country you're from, because I do have a buddy, you know, Justin, uh, who's, who's my partner in this. His river water tastes uh, nasty, he says. Mm. But I've never noticed a, t a, a flat flavor or anything like that. It's just hot water. Yeah, this tastes fine. If it was a little colder, it'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Joel, so for the most part, you've had it pretty easy, but now it's going to be just a little bit more difficult. Not terrible, but... What you need to do is you need to find yourself, you can do it however you want, but what I would do is I would find myself a natural rake, like a stick that's got maybe a fork on it or whatever, sure. and gather a bunch of these leaves up and stuff them in your bag. You're going to want to try and be careful that you don't get a lot of little sticks and stuff in there, but the initial base of your bed is going to be these leaves. And after that, we'll tr go try to find some of that swamp grass to make it super cushy. But when you sit down on it, you want at least six inches, they say four, four to six inches of material, compressed material, to get you up off the ground, because mm. otherwise the ground will suck the heat right out of you. I've actually been sitting in a, sh a shelter just like this, been totally baking hot on top because of a fire, and feel the cold sucking right out of my side or whatever I'm laying on. Sure. So we'll start, you've got a lot of leaf material right here, we'll start with this, and then we'll go get some swamp grass. How many bags of leaves is that, Joe? It's only the second. Just trying, just trying to get twigs and stuff out of it. Yeah. It's kind of a pain, isn't it? Takes a while. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I've got Joe out there collecting some swamp grass. I think he's a little surprised at how much material I'm making him gather. I don't want him to be cold. I don't want him to have ground transfer. I'm not making him gather any more than I would personally. When you wake up in the middle of the night and you feel that cold ground sucking the warmth out of you, the next time you gather twice as much material as what you had originally wanted to. So it's not that I'm doing any, you know, making him work harder than I would work. He just, you know, it takes a lot of materials. It's, it's a different way of camping, you know. Obviously we could have brought a mat and stuff, but we're kind of putting a little bit of aspects of, you know, survival, bushcraft type stuff in there with just normal having fun camping. So he's doing a great job. All right, I'll uh, show you what my camp looks like. All right, I got my poncho, poncho liner in there for my uh, underquilt. I've got a zero degree bag. I don't really, you know, I could have brought the patrol bag for my MSS. I just didn't feel like unzipping it. That's a super comfortable, cheap old sleeping bag. Anyway, this is a hammock setup. This is the way I want to camp. So let the young guy struggle. Or not struggle, but we'll let the young guy uh, work hard. I'll sit back and snooze in my hammock. Okay, here's my setup. You can see I got a little piece of oil skin cloth down the bottom. Put my socks on, my boots next to it. This is my Hennessy hammock. Normally with this Hennessy hammock, it's designed for the ridgeline of the tarp to be the ridgeline of your hammock. I decided to get mine up. I'm experimenting it with getting it up a little bit higher now. Okay. Nothing too fancy. Just a hammock setup. This is what Joe's got cracking over here. He's been hydrating. He's good about hydrating. So that's about two bags of leaves. I told him he had half as much as what he needed. We'll see after he gets done with the grass. If he fills that bag full of grass, that may be enough. So I just don't want him to get cold. All right, on to the next project. Okay guys, well here's Joe's bed. We got him a piece of oil cloth to lay on top of for a vapor barrier. 
And then we've got this two Hudson Bay blankets. You know, the bottom one is a little bit bigger. I told him about the burrito wrap. Um, I don't think he's going to need to do that tonight. And, you know, it's a great theory. I just can't do it. It's too claustrophobic and I toss and turn too much. Plus, Joe says he's a hot sleeper. With that much wool, I'd be very surprised if he gets cold. But anyway, he'll have a little bit. You can tell that they're a little bit different. This one's a little thinner, it looks like. You know, they're still Hudson Bay blankets, but this one's a little bit thinner. He'll have this layer of wool under him in addition to all that grass he laid in it, it. It compressed quite a bit, but I think he's still got at least four inches, so I think he'll be fine in addition, like I said, to that wool underneath him. He'll be able to bring this up over the top of him and then maybe even have a double layer of this one over the top of him, maybe just single layer. This one's only a three and a half point. Either way, he's got a lot of wool there. All right, guys, this is Joe's first flint and steel fire. He made char cloth. It looks to me like the char cloth is just fine. So let's, uh, let's check it out. Go ahead, Joe. Put the char cloth a little closer to the edge of the flint. There you go. Little spark there. Yep. And the wind's blowing too, that doesn't help. That's okay. If it rips, it still works. It's just you got to get it kind of close to the edge. There, just like that. Even as close to the edge as you can without it hitting the... Here, let's take some of this char cloth. Mm -hmm. And we'll put it in there. Okay. You said don't, you don't want it to be bundled up, right? No. So like that? Yep. spark. You might have to flip the, uh, turn the, find a sharp edge of your flint, whether it be that edge or the other edge. Okay. I'm going to get you that other piece of flint. Okay. So get a, get the, there you go. Yeah, just and then move your thumb out of the way. Put, you can put your thumb like back there. There, oh, okay. there you go. God, this stuff is so fragile. Yeah, it is. Oh, it's close. Yep. Good. That was close too. There you go. You got to see multiple yep. sparks there. Okay, I'll take the striker and I'll take the flint. You got plenty of time. Just grab it and put it in there. There you go. Now wrap up that tinder bundle or, you know. Try to pinch that ember in there because you want to kind of close it in there. Once it starts smoking like crazy like that, you can blow a little bit harder. Yep, blow hard on there. There you go. Dump it in there. And then put your smalls on. Oh boy. <laughs> That's alright, just get them smaller ones on there. You gotta hurry up and kinda add them. There you go. But didn't kill it. That's okay. You can blow on it now, even too. Get your head to the side. There you go, now let that fire work. Go ahead and put all them smalls on there. What is that? It's just, I don't know, there's something in there. <laughs> there you go, spread it all out. There you go. Now you said you had a little bit of that birch bark in your pocket? Yep. Throw that on there. Ideally our smalls would have been quite a bit smaller. Okay. But uh, that'll work. Duly noted. Yep. And then we'll just just keep nursing that, keep putting I mean you totally did it. Nice job, man. First flint and steel fire. Awesome. Nice job. Oh. 
it's kind of cool to see that thing boy that that the cloth really just like keeps that ember yeah it that's does. amazing yep should i start yeah okay. yep start throwing stuff in there all right man nice job thank you do you think you're closer i would go a little bit closer kind of like how mine is Yeah, just put it in at an angle. There yeah. you go. Yep. What do you think about this? Pretty rough camping like this, huh? <laughs> Eating like kings. A little venison on the barbie here. On the barbie. All right, Joe, you're eating some venison with no salt, no pepper, nothing. Just straight up over the fire. What do you think? meat that I just cooked over a fire that I just made. There's something pretty special about that, I think. Right on, man. You don't get this a lot in the city. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Phenomenal. That's awesome. So, Joe, a little bit different type of camping. What did you think? Got a little chilly in the middle of the night, but overall, I, I think once I figured out my blanket situation, I, it was actually pretty comfortable, a lot more comfortable than I thought it would be. So. Well, and I was surprised too, looking at the thermometer. Like I said earlier, it's it's less than 20. I know that with that cheap old thermometer. It's in the teens right now, so you did pretty good. So, all right, man. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for being a good sport. Thank you. All right. Well, I got the four wheeler going in the background, but I just wanted to show you guys this. Look at how much that compressed. That compressed down. That's that's at least maybe three inches of material right there, but you can totally see how his body contours were there and everything. So, I mean, he had a ton of material there and he's got more off to the side. We could have done a log bed or something like that to keep it all in one place, but either way, that had compressed a lot. All right, guys, well, we exposed Joe to a little different way of camping and uh, he and I kind of was reminiscing around the campfire. It was kind of a nice deal. So anyway, it was pretty cool. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Take care.